everyone. Um, I'd like to warmly welcome everyone to the second MSM Global Marketing Office Thinking. My name is Sunita Qureshi, and I am filling up for my colleague May Arthur, who's stuck with a, no electricity at her home because of the recent um, thunderstorms. In this series of thinkings, we discuss some of the most pressing issues in international education. We focus on some concerns faced by our dear international students and brainstorm strategies that will help institutions in addressing these issues. Now, in, uh, apart from enabling institutions to reach out to various student markets, we also aim to help them retain international students by improving their study experience. In this line of endeavor at MSM, we came up with these webinar series where we will gather industry experts and let them share their valuable knowledge and experience in international education. Today, we will talk about creating a global reach with limited staff and resources. The pandemic has weighed heavily on higher education institutions in more ways than one. With dwindling international enrollment numbers and the consequent decrease in income, institutions are now pressurized to seek out students across the globe with limited staff and resources. The question is, how can it be done? Today, we will discuss how institutions can create a global reach with limited staff and resources. We will touch on innovative marketing strategies. With limited resources, universities and colleges need to come up with innovative initiatives to shore up enrollment numbers. What they have done in the past few months is are going to the fall term. We will also try to talk about some compromises in expenses, what items in the institution's budgets need to be cut in order to ensure sustainable operations. And we will also touch on third party service providers and how they can help in terms of providing international student recruitment services at a lower cost. So let's begin. So now I would like to introduce um, our special guests for tonight. They are experts in their respective fields and have substantial experience in international education and they are here to share with all of us their thoughts and ideas on this topic. First of all, friends, let's welcome Mr. Judge Dolani. Judge is a vice president for marketing of Bay Atlantic University. He's a marketing expert with over 20 years of experience in various industries, including consumer packaged goods, food service, and higher education. Currently, he's overall in charge of the marketing operations of Bay Atlantic University. Under his leadership, the university's fall 21 intake has become 63% bigger than pre-COVID semesters and the total revenues went up by 80%. Judge holds a business administration degree from the University of Louisville and an MBA from the University of Illinois. Our next resource speaker is Mr. Jim Paul. Jim is currently the director of the US Commercial Service, a division of the US Department of Commerce office in Boston. Jim has more than 25 years of work experience in international trade, assisting US exporters in penetrating markets overseas. As this agency's former global education team leader, he coordinated numerous programs worldwide to assist US schools with their international recruitment activities. Prior to this position, Jim served as the international trade manager for the World Trade Center Association in Los Angeles, California. He graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Economy of Industry Societies from the University of California, Berkeley. He later received a Master of Business Administration in International Management from the Thunderbird School of Global Management. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. And during this um, thinking, we will hear Judge and Jim speak about your insights on creating a global reach with limited manpower and um, resources. So I'll open up the floor to both Judge and um, Jim. I guess I'll, I'll just go first. Um, thank you, Sunita, for, for the introduction. It's a pleasure for uh, me to be here um, and, and talk about you know, some of the big changes that have happened in the industry in the past couple of years. I mean, even 
before COVID, um, a lot of changes were happening. So, you know, this last couple of years have, I would say, just expedited um, those, uh, those changes in the industry. So glad to be here. Okay, great. And um, I'd also like to comment too, uh, we've seen from our agency, because we've worked with all types of educational institutions from private middle schools, boarding schools, community colleges, four-year schools, community colleges, and grad programs. Um, as Georgie said, I'll be, we've seen a lot of changes within the industry and, and uh, certainly, you know, with limited budgets and scope and certainly not being able to travel right now, um, we've seen a lot of schools use virtual programs right now and also trying to pave the way for when they can return travel. But uh, that's one thing our agency is here for is to sit these schools, go ahead and uh, increase their international student recruitment numbers during these challenging times. Okay, so I uh, have a question that when we're talking of innovative marketing uh, strategies, you know, that are for, you know, our um, schools. So, you know, with limited resources, you know, uh, Jersey, this one is for you. What do you think, you know, you will be taking up, you know, this at uh, Bay Atlantic University with, you know, compromises in expenses, you know, and, you know, how, do, how will you create, you know, innovative marketing um, strategies? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question. Um, I, would, I would actually take it two steps back and, and talk a little bit about how we got here, right? To, to the point where uh, budgets now have been, you know, the main focus of all of the schools. Um, with even pre-COVID um, in the US, uh, what's happening is, you know, there's a huge demographic shift, right? Our, our population is aging. So the number of students that are graduating from high school is constantly declining, even before COVID, even before 2019. So what used to be the bread and butter of American universities, which is, you know, high school students graduating and moving on to college is constantly declining and is declining by, I think, um, uh, I was looking at some numbers and before, uh, in 2019, before COVID, it was roughly about, three point or, or 30, 37 million people were actually graduating. Now that number has uh, constantly started to decline. So what's happened is a lot of these universities now are struggling because you know the money's not there anymore, right? There's not enough students. So they have to fill those students in with uh, international students. And with COVID putting a complete limit in terms of you know, students being able to travel here. Now you have all of these US institutions who turned all of their marketing budgets to the US market, right? And what we saw, um, especially for a small university like ours, you know, our cost per click went up three percent, like 300%, you know, uh, and, and it became almost impossible for us to use our marketing budgets effectively. So we had to shift, you know, our mindset. Uh, we have to, we had to shift how we worked and how we reached international students. So the first thing you know, that we did was um, we literally just got our marketing budget, I would say probably by about 90%. Um, and we focused on just fixing our operations, right? Fixing our funnel. And then the other part is, well, we still need to reach international students. There are still markets out there that are open. How do we do it with a very, very limited budget? And that's where, um, that's where agencies like MSM and different partners come in. I think that that would be, you know, from, from a core perspective, um, how we were able to kind of turn the tide. Thank you, uh, Jaj. And uh, another question for you is, do you think partnering with recruitment agencies can help widening the reach of institutions without spending a lot of marketing and mobilizing their own staff to recruit. Absolutely. Um, I actually wrote um, just a, a long piece on, on LinkedIn because I was, I was thinking about this. I mean, I talked to a lot of different partners and I talked to a lot of different agencies and, and I talked to a lot of different schools as well. And, and I don't understand why there is, well, uh, a little bit, I guess, but why there is, um, such a, a reluctance to work with international partners to grow your enrollment, right? I mean, you know, for a lot of them, it's really at no cost. Basically, a student comes in, and if you're enrolled, then, you know, um, then you follow up with the next steps, right? But if there's no enrollment, um, then it's, it's practically a no cost, right? I mean, 
Obviously, there's some operational side because your admissions team is constantly working on different applications, but that's where it, it's really important to just find just a handful of very, very good, strong, responsive partners that will make that difference for you. Yeah, thank you. Jim, what do you think, you know, uh, do you think it's more practical, uh, you know, for institutions to do recruitment or, you know, elicit the help of education management service providers, you know, from the angle of a trade office, you know, what do you think, you know, what is more practical for schools? That's a great question. Um, certainly one of the trends we're seeing is that more and more schools are using recruitment partners and service providers. Um, you know, certainly it's much leaner times for many educational institutions. And, um, you know, we've seen, you know, just here anecdotally in Massachusetts, um, you know, many more schools are using them that weren't doing it before. Um, and it's also a great way to further diversify their markets. Um, you know, a number of schools, very understandably, they have most of their students from like one or two markets, but this is a great hedge for them in terms of having much wider breadth. And, you know, that helps with recruitment, how many countries you have at your disposal. And, um, you know, it just trying to spread the word um, as much as you can in terms of engaging these international partners. Um, we're seeing more and more. And so, so we definitely recommend it from our end. Right. And uh, so now here, uh, Judge, can you stand, uh, share, you know, any recruitment strategies that you have used uh, that has helped keeping uh, the cost down at the Atlantic? Sure. Um, from, uh, you know, there's, there's two parts to this, right? So the, the first part is from, from a domestic standpoint, you know, we focused on, uh, on relationships. Uh, uh, relationships internally with different, you know, government agencies, non-governmental agencies, and, uh, you know, we've shifted the focus to what, what we consider here adult learners, which is, you know, from a demographic perspective, you know, age 21 and up. From an international perspective, we've become a little bit more, um, I would say, more targeted, right? So we look at, you know, given the, the COVID situation, we look at countries that have a little bit more laxed um, travel restrictions, right? Um, we look at um, countries where historically we've also had a lot more interest, you know, in, in the types of degrees that we offer. Um, and we've worked specifically with partners and strengthened our partnerships there to, to ensure that, you know, our partners are not, are, are almost like an extension of our university, right? I think of our partners as, as employees of Bay Atlantic University. Um, and, and I also think of myself, you know, at the school, at uh, the school that I work at as, as almost an employee of the partner, right? So any issue the, the partner has, it's my issue that, that we have to deal with. And, and those, uh, those are the, the, the main areas. I mean, at the end of the day, um, it's come down to strengthening partnerships, whether it's domestically or internationally. Yeah, thank you, Judge. So now, you know, we've seen a sudden surge, you know, in the spell of, you know, students arriving in the U.S., you know, I mean, though, of course, U.S. has always been, you know, the top destination for international students. But now, you know, recently we're seeing a big uptake in the number of students and, you know, it, it's all... Among all the destinations, you know, U.S. is being talked about. So, Jim, what do you think from a trade office perspective? You know, what would you want to add on to this? Well, it, um, first of all, um, so our agency um, we assist exporters in all industries, and so we've received a lot of support um, in Washington, um, especially lately, um, and. Um, we, and, and that's because of the importance of the industry um, in terms of that. So we've refocused our efforts in terms of trying to bring, um, you know, that many more, you know, students here. And, you know, certainly the $45 billion that international students spend on tuition living expenses, but that's, you know, then they have the intangibles of, you know, um, you know, 
folks that study here in the United States are more likely to engage, become future distributors or business leaders or political leaders overseas. And there's no way to quantify that, but it's something that we see repeatedly in our other industries, how many distributors overseas were educated in the United States. So it's a critical industry for our agency um, in terms of engagement and really at all levels. And just one last thing I want to add is, is we've refocused in terms of working with U.S. boarding schools and even private middle schools, trying to bring in the international students that much sooner, because then they're obviously much more likely to stay for the community colleges and four-year schools and possibly grad school afterwards. Uh, that is very, um, you know, insightful. And as we've seen that the numbers, of course, have dropped down, you know, so are there any steps that you think that the government has been taken to, you know, to increase the mobility of international students? We have, and, and I think, for, I mean, there's, certainly there are some of a number of uh, issues which, um, you know, that, that we can't just can't help in terms of the United States. Obviously, you know, we do have higher tuition. Um, we, um, there's also increased uh, foreign government competition um, in terms of staffing resources overseas as well, in terms of trying to draw more and more international students. And, um, and then there's also a, you know, visas and, and all, but in terms of um, our agency, in terms of what we're seeing is, you know, increased collaboration, uh, not just with you know, our embassies and consulates, but also the different government agencies. So we're working closer and closer with US State Department of Education USA and, you know, all our colleagues always promote their programs as well. And, you know, if a school is interested in our agency or education USA, then that's great, whichever, you know, they're more most comfortable with, but we work very collaboratively with them in many countries overseas, just trying to, you know, whichever is best for the school. And I think that's um, one, important aspect and also outreach. And so this is a great outreach opportunity. So thank you, because we do try to spread the word as much as we can in terms of all available resources for US schools. Um, I, I, sorry, can I just follow up? Uh, I actually have a question for, for Jim, uh, just to, as, a, as a follow up on this. And, and I know this may not be your area, but um, one of the things that we've noticed, you know, when it comes to competition, right? Like for students, and one of the things is, uh, you know, we get a lot of students that go to Australia. We get a lot of students that go to Canada, right? Um, and when we look at total cost in terms of tuition, you know, some of these universities in Australia and, and in Canada are a lot more expensive than ours, right? The number one reason that um, I hear for students going to different countries that are not coming here in the US is because they have a lot more flexibility, right? Like whether it's easier to get a work permit, you know, and, and not just do work study because as a work study, and you know this very well, right? Like you, you don't necessarily get paid the, the minimum wage because you're kind of here to learn, right? Uh, but that's a, for a lot of students, that's a make it or break it, right? So, so a lot of students are coming from countries where the average monthly, paycheck is $280. I mean, look at Latin America, you know, the highest is Uruguay at 520 bucks, right? So a month and now they're coming to these universities and having to spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a semester. I wonder if there is talk of kind of just making that easier. So there probably is talk. And, and so really happy you brought that up because that's a really critical aspect of the conversation. It is not, you are right, it's not our area um, in terms of our agency. Um, yeah. We do recognize there are all those challenges with work study and other areas in which international students are drawn to other countries. Um, there's no question. Um, so we're not, our agency is not involved in those discussions. Mm -hmm. You know, for us, we're mainly, our main mission is really to work with, um, you know, the schools that are interested in trying to increase their outreach and exposure overseas and help them gain partnerships and visibility. Um, so uh, that, that is one area where we do have separation, but that's a great point. Yeah. So just wanting to ask, you know, Jim, uh, talking of OPT and other employment the op components, are there enough persuasions for the students to choose the U.S.? And again, so those are great questions. And, and, and that is definitely just, it's really critical. And unfortunately, I'm not the right person to answer it because I just don't know 
um, enough and uh, it's, it's not our agency, but uh, you know, those are critical. And, you know, one good aspect is that whether it's uh, NAFSA, whether it's, you know, ARC, ISEF, I mean, all these different programs that are um, taking place. I mean, a lot of government agencies are more and more visible there. And, and so, um, you know, they're happy to certainly answer those those questions, but I do agree it's an important topic, but again, our role is just on uh, promotion of the educational programs overseas. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to tell us more about, you know, the study USA destination program? So we have a lot of people in the audience and it will be very uh, useful for everybody to know this. Yes, and I'll try to keep it just a couple minutes. So, so, so thank you for that. Um, so our, you know, we, we've been doing virtual connection programs even before the pandemic. Um, so, um, one area is we assist schools what's called with virtual education fairs. Um, and basically what we use is we, we have about six participating U.S. schools uh, in each virtual education fair, and they're connected to our colleagues at the U.S. embassies and consulates in a certain market. Um, for example, like, you know, one recent one we did was with Brazil. So our colleague in Brasilia, for all of Brazil, she went out to this event, she invited education agents and other partners and counselors to this event. And it was all virtual. So everyone was using whichever video platform it was. And each school presented up to 10 minutes of PowerPoint. They had they could have a current Brazilian stu student speaking Portuguese. And it's a great way to go ahead and make inroads and make those connections. Um, and everyone gets each other's contact information as well. On a larger scale, we've had, as you mentioned, these virtual connection programs. Um, in fact, we're having one in a couple of weeks with Middle East and Africa. And so our colleagues at the embassies and consulates, they're reaching out to recruitment partners, counselors, you know, consultants, all other types of partners as well in those markets. And US schools could go ahead and participate in that and have one-on-one -on -one virtual meetings with those partners as well. And then we do that on an individual basis um, as well. For each school, we could line up your own appointments just one-on-one, -on -one, your own timing uh, with these various types of partners. And our colleagues at the U.S. Embassy's Consulates make those introductions on behalf of your school to those recruitment agents and other partners. So that's one reason why schools do use us is because they like the introductions and also in the local language because most of our staff are from those countries and they speak the local language. They have great contacts, uh, various agencies, the ministries, the Asian associations as well. Um, and so those are some, one thing I, I do need to mention though, we are mandated to have cost recovery fees. They're very nominal for each type of these programs. Um, and uh, good news is no matter the size of the school, uh, we've been able to get an exemption um, from our colleagues in DC that uh, each school um, uh, would submit payment just for the small company fee. Um, so that way it's much more reduced versus other industries as well. Quick, quick question. Sorry, sorry, Sunita, because I just wanted to have, you know, this is this is a great introduction for me too um, on, on Study USA. So I, I'm going to use this opportunity to ask some questions as well uh, to right. Jim. Um, now, if, if you are kind of the, the point of contact, does that make it easier to for students from a certain country, for example, let's say I'm, we're recruiting students from Ethiopia. Does that make it easier for those students to get visas from the Ethiopian embassy to come to the US? Because you know, uh, you were the point of introduction. Um, it doesn't technically, with that being said, um, you know, with the State Department, a lot of times the visa consular officers will work very closely with our offices. So they're aware of which schools are recruiting in that market. Gotcha. And so, you know, that can help. Um, but, um, you know, really it still does come down to, um, you know, obviously the student, his or her interview. Um, and one aspect I just want to mention about the interviews is that you know, for those that don't use Education USA with the State Department, that they do provide great counseling service to the students. Um, and that's one thing that we do mention um, in terms of really best preparing them for the interviews. 
Um, and obviously any letters and documentation from the school is terrific. Um, but you know, sometimes we can't provide introductions to the visa consular um, officers um, in terms of specific questions. And that's very helpful when schools are engaging with them too. Uh, that way they can pass that information on to the students. Gotcha. Perfect, thank you. Great, great question, thank you. I want to check that how are U.S. universities, you know, responding to desired um, program trends among international students, and how are these aligned with labor market demands? You know, Jez, would you want to talk about this? Sure. Uh, obviously, because of the increased competition, um, you know, with with schools, uh, the the one way to differentiate yourself is to to go after programs that are in high demand by international students, right? Um, and for example, if you look at Southeast Asia, a lot of uh, IT, you know, MBA programs are in high demand uh, with students there. So a lot of the schools try to customize those programs as well. Uh, but also, you know, and I can speak for, for BAU, one of the main things that we focus on is that, you know, we don't have a lot of programs, right? Like you can't come in here for, for a degree in psychology because what we do is we focus on programs that are highly employable, right? Political science, um, obviously being where we are in Washington, DC, uh, computer science, uh, which is in, in high demand and also um, our business and MBA program, which is also in high demand. And then the other way we focus is we, we try to improve those programs, right? Um, because we know that international students are very discerning. Right at the end of the day, this is a big expense. This is a big, big cost. And um, unlike most purchases, education is an experiential purchase. You know, in most cases, you don't necessarily know what you get until you've done your four years and you have your diploma in your hand, and you see how employable you are after those four years with that diploma. So it's really important for universities to work on their rankings. You know, for example, our MBA program uh, was um, uh, this year uh, was ranked number 26 um, in the country by intelligent.com and our master's in cybersecurity was ranked number 22 um, in the country by uh, intelligent.com as well. And to that, I mean, those are some of the ways we differentiate ourselves. Yeah. Thank you. And do you think uh, alumni plays a big role in the recruitment? And do you also consider peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, student recruitment as well? Um, sure, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll take this. Absolutely. Um, at the end of the day, um, there are three main impacts into what type of school students choose. You know, it's, it's basically family's opinion, right? Is your peer's opinion, right? And it's your guidance counselor's opinion. And when I when I think of the alumni, right, that could be a family member, that could be a peer, right? So as long as that we we are able to provide that experience and engage with our alumni, they're going to do the most most of the work from a mar, uh, from a word of mouth uh, perspective. And I don't think universities leverage that very well. I mean, there's some that, that do, obviously the big ones, but when you talk about small to mid-sized universities like ours, uh, there's a lot of work that we can do in that aspect as well. And I think partners could help with, uh, with things like that as well. You know, reaching out to, uh, helping us reach out to alumni, you know, that we're able to come in through the same, through that partner, right? Let's say it's MSM. Um, and, and form those contexts as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So like, you know, getting into, you know, the meat of the discussion, you know, creating global reach with limited staff and resources, you know, how can smaller institutions, you know, actually create a global um, outreach, you know? Do you have, you know, any, um, you know, advice or suggestions, you know, for smaller institutions, you know, for them to have a global outreach? Judge, do you want to take this? Um, sure. Um, I mean, this is two part, and I think Jim can definitely handle, you know, his part as well. But I'll talk okay. about from a, from an institution perspective. Um, from an institution's perspective, like I said, I'll, I'll go back to something that I said earlier in 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 the conversation that, you know, partners are your employees, right? And and in a way, you're if you uh, sign up with partners that have a global reach, you've basically 
maximize your size of your employees at virtually no risk to you, right? Uh, and especially if they're a trusted partner. So it's the, in, in my mind, it's the easiest way to capitalize on, on making yourself be bigger than some of the big state institutions at zero the cost, right? Um, or, or in ways that, that it kind of pays for itself. So I, I think that's the easiest, really, it's, it's the, just the lowest hanging fruit. Yep. And uh, really just to add from our perspective, we do work with a lot of the smaller institutions, uh, really one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, so again, we do have nominal cost recovery fees for our programs and not every school could certainly afford that right now in each market. Um, so what we do is each of our colleagues, so we have offices in hundred locations across the United States. So there is a local office for each US school and always happy to go ahead and make an introduction as well. Um, but they would go ahead and work with you and help identify, we have various market research resources from our embassies and our consulates in terms of what are the top markets for you to go ahead and approach for your type of school and for your type of program? What's the best recruitment method as well? And so we will help you target that. And so uh, maybe choosing just a few of them, um, but also my overseas colleagues are always happy to go ahead and have a one-on-one -on -one video meeting. Obviously there's no charge for that. Mm -hmm. To really decipher, is this a good market? Is this a good uh, uh, return on investment for you in terms of your time and any types of resources? And a lot of times they'll provide contacts only at no charge as well to do that. A couple other ways is um, certainly um, various groups. So uh, most states have what's called a study state consortium. Many of you are probably aware of that. So those are great groups of educational institutions um, that are located in each state. And they have various activities as well as a great resource. They have websites, they have different events, and they share a lot of costs. And the other manner too is for your type of school, for example, a number of boarding schools, they might do events together. And that's a great way for them to go ahead and share costs as well. Maybe they're looking at different parts of the country. And so that's one area that we've really seen in terms of smaller schools, how they really team up with various types of other schools and also trying to engage various resources. And again, not just our agency, but also um, Education USA. Yeah. So as we're talking of the four uh, stakeholders here, you know, the government, the institutions, the partners and uh, students, and we do understand that government policies do have an impact on this and larger institutions have enough resources to set up a captive recruitment um, structures. What is your opinion about, you know, in-country offices, you know, are these attractive for, uh, uh, you know, the universities and the colleges and how does the trade office, you know, look at in-country offices? Jim, do you want to, you know? Sure. So, so like in, in country, like in country offices, um, sure. You know, that, that definitely is its tremendous benefit. And obviously, yes, of course, the larger schools have that um, uh, opportunity. And so I think when you know, it really helps you solidify your presence in the market, I mean, um, you know, just from branding, I mean, we've seen that the first education mission I, I went on was uh, to Japan. And, um, you know, I, I remember that one of the smallest schools in our mission group of 12 was actually the most active and had the most students visiting because they had, you know, established a presence in the market for seven years. And so as much as schools could do that, then certainly the, you know, the best, but obviously that takes a tremendous amount of resources. Thank you. And I think we have questions um, coming up uh, from the uh, audience as well. So I'm going to, you know, take a few questions. There's one interesting question that has come up is, how does the increasing adoption of TikTok and real media and new social media platforms affect, uh, you know, international marketing to students, if at all, you know, Judge, this is a view from the university perspective. Obviously, um, you know, the, the advent of uh, TikTok and uh, social media um, has, has added more one-on-one -on -one conversation with prospective students, right? 
but I wouldn't say that it has changed the way marketing is done, right? It's just more at a personal level. Um, you know, a lot of the research that has come up uh, shows that most of the uh, followers of uh, school social media accounts are actually students, right? So when I look at things like that, like, you know, the uh, uh, school's TikTok page or, or a school social media page, I look at that as most of it being kind of internal um, internal communication. You know, it's, it's a way for students to kind of check what's going on on campus, what's happening, what are some of the events. Um, but it also adds a little bit more of a view into what the school is. So for example, what we do at BAU, we've changed our social media strategy where we focus on just three areas. You know, let's take Instagram, for example. You know, we want to show one, what DC looks like, right? Two, we want to show what our school looks like. And three, we want to show what our students, you know, do on a day in or a day out basis, because we feel, you know, as an international student, you're traveling to a new country, you're traveling to a new city, and you want to kind of have an idea, okay, well, what's the food scene in DC, right? It may not have anything to do with the school directly, but it does have to do with the experience of being part of that school, right? Even the local food scene. Um, if there are events where you know some of our students are traveling to some of the museums, we want to show that because at the end of the day, you know, uh, when you're deep into academic thought, you only think about well, we have to have amazing programs and we have to have amazing degrees, and sometimes we forget the fact that that the the educational experience, the college experience, is not just your grades; it's everything. It's the connections that you form. It's it's the connection that you form with the city. And and like Jim was saying, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of these international students end up, you know, loving the cities they're they're staying in or the states they're staying in, and they you know might end up staying here or might end up opening businesses here, um, and and that's all part of the whole integrated uh, college experience. And that's what social media helps do. Absolutely. There's another question is, should a university mention its COVID-19 strategy or response as a part of its promotion to international um, students? Um, I mean, from, from my perspective, absolutely. I, I think oversharing is better than not sharing at all. Right. Um, at the end of the day, you know, COVID is 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 serious. I mean, with it's affected millions of people, you know, and, and I don't want to go through, you know, the news and the statistics because we've all heard them and we've lived them. And it's it's I would say probably, you know, the only shared global experience that our generation has had. Right. Um, and 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 I think sharing those, it it also creates a sense of comfort. You know, if you're an international student and you kind of understand what's what's happening and how information is shared, I think that all plays a role into it. You know, if I could just add to that, I completely agree. I definitely agree in terms of oversharing um, information. And, you know, what George was mentioning um, also gave me just another um, thought, um, just in terms of COVID-19 is, Obviously, students from these countries and the parents, they want to hear directly from, you know, students from that country uh, that are at the school as well. So as much as schools are able to, you know, have podcasts of the current students, um, uh, other testimonials on their websites, you know, as much as possible. So obviously, as George was also mentioning earlier about alums, and, you know, I, I know that that's always a challenge in terms of keeping in touch with your alumni, but definitely while the students are there, try and engage them as much as you can, you know, and have them part of your website, um, testimonials, and, and also, you know, speaking in terms of their experience of COVID-19 in terms of on the campuses, and I agree, just, you know, oversharing is definitely a good thing, because I think everyone has those questions. Yeah, totally. So what are the risk mitigations, protections, and control in place for universities when they work with service providers and agents to increase their uh, global reach? So Jess, you might take this question. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, great. So um, you know, just in terms of that, so one, one big aspect, I mean, and again, we've seen more and more schools use recruitment partners as, as we've been talking about, and no question, and service providers. Um, so, um, you know, from our 
angle, it's really critical um, in terms of having some type of due diligence on these recruitment partners overseas. And that is an area where we've seen, that's why we've really enhanced our program specifically uh, for this area in terms of introductions, credibility, some type of checks, making sure they're part of an agency association overseas, how much you know, do our colleagues, are, are they aware of these um, agencies and other partners as well? And, the other aspect is that, um, you know, our colleagues can also help um, with any kind of miscommunication there might be in terms of any type of partnership agreement. Um, they're there. They speak the local language and they speak English. So uh, they're there in terms of helping to make sure that, you know, if a school has a question, is this typical for this market, um, that they, they could go ahead and run that by our colleague at the embassy and, and consulate. And, and also we could uh, run it by other government agencies as well. Yeah, that is helpful. And there's another question which comes in, you know, why is it taught that and there's always a reluctance to work with international partners, you know, is it the, you know, the geographical distance or is it the cost or uh, risk involved? From my perspective, it's, um, and George certainly being with the school um, and all his experience, um, definitely chime in after, but um, you know, um, obviously there is the fee that's associated with it, setting up the partnership. Um, but what we've seen from our ends is that having a recruitment partner really does pay dividends in the long run um, in terms of having folks. And it's, again, diversifying your countries as much as you can, because uh, there might be an issue with some of the top countries that are sending students over. Um, and obviously we've seen that. And so, you know, that's a great way to go ahead and really sustain your global reach as much as possible. Um, but, you know, and I think for a lot of schools, once they have some recruitment partners, it becomes that much easier. Like once you have an SOP in place to go ahead and use it and you'll see other schools that are doing it. And I think, you know, whichever uh, form you're trying to get those recruitment partners. Um, there are lots of resources there that are able to go ahead and assist you. Yeah. Um, from, from my perspective, a bad partner can destroy your brand in a country, you know, and, and that you can't repair. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a big partner. It could be just one very small office who, and, and it happens, right? Like where, where they charge students up front and then they never actually send the application. So what happens is schools get calls and they say, hey, I already paid, you know, the partner $2,000 and you're like, you know, sorry, we don't have an application for you, right? But, but to a student, to a student, that partner represents the school, right? So like to a student that they, they you know, there's no time to discern that, listen, the school has done nothing wrong. And, you know, that partner has actually spoken in, in the name of the school. And that really affects your brand, right? The worst thing that you want to do is, is to destroy your trust, um, especially with international students. So I think that's the, that's probably the main reason for the reluctance. Uh, the other is there is practically zero barriers to entry to be a partner. Right. I mean, I may be wrong, but there's really zero barriers to entry. Right. You can call a school up and say, hey, I have an office in Bangladesh and we recruit, you know, 100 students every semester. And, and there's no way for a small school to to really check. Right. So I, I can understand the reluctance. And that's why that's why it takes a little bit of doing due diligence, just like Jim said, and actually even, you know, working with partners just like Jim and, and making, you know, they have offices there and have them kind of go through that due diligence as well. So those are risks that can be mitigated, but you have to you have to understand that those are big risks. So, yeah. Yeah. But the next question is so connected to this that international recruitment is a long game. So how does the university make it and ensure that you know, it entails diversity as a larger part of its culture? It's, it's tough. <laughs> it's, it's tough to convince your, your bosses and the presidents of the university that listen, it's all about relationship building and relationships take a long time to build, especially the good trusted ones, right? But I mean, that's our job. You know, our job is to, to focus on the day-to-day -day operation. And like I said, you know, in, in our school, you know, I look at I look at partners as our employees, right? Um, and um, and we we 
constantly, you know, you guys' problem is my problem uh, at the same time. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of uh, educating internally, you know, educating the admissions team, educating, you know, our uh, directors and, 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 and university presidents that, that this takes time, uh, that, you know, to, from, from, a, from a cycle perspective, it takes two years and four months on average to get a high school student to sit in a college seat, right? And when you're talking about adult learners, it takes roughly about six to seven months. Right. So, so as long as everybody understands that, um, then I think it, it makes it easier uh, to, to do the work. Jim, what do you think, you know, is the government's long-term support for universities in reclaiming the U.S. market share in international education? You know, it, it absolutely is. And, and so, um, again, it, it affects so many aspects of our economy. Um, you know, certainly the educational institution itself and to all the jobs it supports, the local communities, the restaurants, travel, tourism. Uh, there was once a statistic um, done by the Massachusetts Port Authority. This is before 9-11, so it's dated, but still it speaks to it that for every um, one year of study of an international student that came to Massachusetts um, at the time, the multiplication factor was 47 in terms of what the economic output was versus that one year of study. And that was because additional years of study and maybe at that school or other schools, future business relationships, alumni events, word of mouth in his or her home country, and then also travel and tourism opportunities and what they add to the local community, everything that they're spending. We also assist with inbound travel tourism, as an example, which really goes hand in hand um, with international education. So it's definitely, I mean, we definitely understand it. Um, you know, Department of Commerce, we're in for the dollars, right? And we're in for the jobs. But obviously there's so many different intangibles that we're all aware of. And also for US students, I mean, there have been studies done in terms of what international students, the benefits for US students um, in terms of they're much more global in nature and more apt to pursue global careers and be more competitive and independent. And, you know, and so there are many different qualities that are really critical for our society. Thank you. And Jill, you mentioned uh, treating partners as employees. So are they aware of this role? And is there clarity on this position as a part of the university's um, ecosystem? I mean, each university has its own kind of work culture, right? And, and some of them, you know, keep partners at arm's length, and then some of them just work closely with partners. It's, I, I think it's a, you know, from, from my perspective, it's a, it's a relationship business. Um, are partners aware of that? It depends, right? Um, I, I would like to think that, you know, you know, the team that I work with at MSM, you know, thinks of me as a partner, as, as, a, as, a, as an employee, or they think of themselves as, as employees here. And I think they do. I mean, we work, um, I would say, very, very well together. Uh, but just like anything else, I mean, you, you have to nurture it, right? Relationships need to be nurtured. And if you put time into it, you know, it, it, you can make it happen. Yeah, thank you. And this has been so um, informative and we'd love to keep it going, dear and Jim. But I'm afraid, you know, we've come to a close after um, such a wonderful uh, uh, discussion. And um, as you know, we're approaching the conclusion of the thinking session. I would like to thank George and Jim who took the time to join us today. We hope the knowledge sharing we had will add immense value to the strategies you're preparing for your students and institutions. Indeed, many of the apprehensions about student recruitment stem from budget issues, manpower, logistics, and connections. All these key ingredients in an effective student recruitment initiatives are often perceived to necessitate a huge budget, but that does not have to be the case. So in this webinar, we touched the role of a third party service providers who can help in more ways than one. Not only do education service providers adopt innovative solutions to student recruitment that can help institutions, they have also established ecosystem to do so without making the institution spend a lot. In MSM, for instance, we adopt a performance-based model that's risk-free, transparent, and straightforward. 
MSM's business model does not require upfront cost and service fees are paid based on the results. In effect, institutions do not need any international recruitment budget to harness the MSM model. And again, not only does the MSM performance-based model help you save on your budget, it also helps you save on time and institutions do not need to spend precious time and effort in forming a recruitment team because MSM will act as your special dedicated team. It is worth noting that MSM is already working in most of the rich student markets that institutions may be interested in, and we are ready to represent you. We are well-established, carefully vetted procedures for onboarding institutions and getting their brand recognized in new markets. We can do this rapidly and effectively and without any upfront investment on your part. Lastly, MSM's track record is unmatched in the industry which makes us industry trade raisers and trusted voices. With a performance-based model, there is no downside to your partnership with us. So again, thank you all for your time today. We appreciate your presence in the webinar and we wish you all the best as we try to help the international education sector and all our partner institutions to bounce back from the pandemic and be stronger than ever. Have a good day, everyone, and thank you very much.